The standoff between a man who was wanted by the FBI and a large number of federal agents surrounding a cabin where a fugitive named Randy Weaver is holed up with his family. In 1992, a bloody standoff between lawmen and an armed white separatist named Randy Weaver left his wife, 14-year-old son, and a federal agent dead. The 11-day siege at a place called Ruby Ridge, Idaho. It happened before Waco, and for many, it's an even bigger rallying cry. I want the truth! You've got the OK Corral. You've got certain moments in the history of American law enforcement where society says, wait a minute, we got to take a look at this in a different way. Ruby Ridge began a paradigm shift. Inadequate performance. Ruby Ridge shook the highest ranks of the FBI, and it remains a watchword wherever law enforcement stands off against barricaded suspects today. This story is used as what not to do. That gives me hope. Maybe we won't make the same mistakes. Maybe we won't rush into things when it's a matter of life or death. I thought they were chasing down a moose or a bear or something. Honestly, I had no clue that there were people with guns in the woods that day. 16-year-old Sarah Weaver was in her family's remote Idaho cabin when their dog ran into the woods barking. Her father, Randy Weaver, a family friend, and her 14-year-old brother Sam followed with their rifles. The next thing she heard was an explosion of gunfire. Everything in me wanted to run down the hill and try and, you know, protect my brother because I knew he was down there and I'd always been his big sister, I'd always been his protector. So there was part of me that just wanted to take off down the driveway and make sure he was okay. Torn, she stayed with her mother and younger sisters until the friend, Kevin Harris, returned. He said that Sam was gone and I think my whole world fell apart at that moment. None of us at that time were thinking that anything worse could happen. But unbeknownst to Sarah, U.S. Marshals had been staking out her parents, who were vehemently anti-government, for months. Her father had fled charges of selling two illegal shotguns, and her mother had indicated they wouldn't surrender without a fight. When the dog uncovered the Marshals' location, an agent shot it, and a gunfight ensued that killed 14-year-old Sam Weaver and a deputy U.S. Marshal named William Deegan. I can't speak for everybody on my team, but I assumed I was walking into a violent situation and it was likely to be a shootout. Scores of federal agents quickly descended the next morning. As sharpshooters like Chris Whitcomb took position around the cabin, they were under an unusual order. If any adult male is observed with a weapon, deadly force can and should be employed. The entire world, for someone in my position at that time, is this big around. You don't see the larger circumstances. You don't see the larger picture. You just see the world through a scope. Dad was wanting to go see Sam one more time and just, I guess, do some more grieving, say goodbye, I don't know. And so I took off after him, and he made it around the shed ahead of me. The people that I saw with assault rifles we're moving from tree to building to wood pile through fog. Uh, I didn't have the shot. My finger was on the trigger. I was trying to take the shot. I didn't have it. I just heard a giant boom. I said, Dad, what happened? And he said, you know, I've been shot. And you know, at this point, my mom had stepped out of the door and she was screaming, what happened, what happened? And get in the house, get in the house. And we all get piled up in front of the door and I hear what goes, I hear what is like a gunshot going off in my ear. And a mom just drops to my side. I knew, I knew what had happened to her immediately. I thought it was the end for all of us at that point. Sarah's mother, Vicki, took a fatal shot to the head as she held the family's 10-month-old baby in her arms. But outside the cabin, no one was aware Vicky was dead, and agents kept trying to negotiate with her. When they got on the bullhorn and started asking for mom to come out and have pancakes for breakfast with her kids and 
wouldn't you want to do that with your children sort of thing? It added, it's a cliche to say it added insult to injury, but it did. As news of the standoff spread, journalists converged on the scene. Two people have already died. Neither side seems ready to back down. The FBI says they will not leave until Weaver and his friend Kevin Harris, who lives with him, are in custody. Everyone here in Naples agrees that Weaver is a white supremacist who just wants to be left alone. For police, he is a fugitive on a federal arms charge, heavily armed and dangerous. And a small army of right-wing sympathizers also gathered on the road below the cabin to protest. The Weavers held out for a total of 11 days. After Vicky was shot, they believed they'd be killed if they stepped outside. The standoff ended only after Bo Greitz, a right-wing presidential candidate sympathetic to the Weavers' cause, negotiated a surrender. Our camera caught a glimpse of the family walking into the staging area. The girl, one of the girls is wearing a red jacket at the bottom of your screen. When I got to the meadow, it was a scene out of a movie. It was inconceivable to me to think that they would need so much and so many people and, and tanks and helicopters. All this for one family. The story was dramatized in a TV movie and folk songs, and it found a ready-made audience. The Ruby Ridge standoff became a kind of founding myth of the radical right. It not only made the government look bad, it was bad. People, whatever views they have, whatever illegal activities they have, should not be shot down by government snipers when they are not actively threatening the life of somebody. Later investigations revealed that law enforcement had made a series of errors. Authorities on the ground communicated poorly with agents arriving from afar, which exaggerated the threat Weaver posed, and agents on the scene failed to negotiate or set up a clear line of communication with the family until it was too late. In the end, jurors decided Randy Weaver's most serious crime was failing to appear in court. And then came accusations that the FBI had attempted to cover up its mistakes. The FBI is feeling the heat. During Weaver's 1993 trial, another FBI standoff ended in tragedy and accusations of misconduct. 76 members of the Branch Davidian religious sect died in a federal raid on their compound in Waco, Texas. There are eerie parallels with Waco. In both cases, government miscalculation in the arrest of a fanatic ended in gunfire and death. The radical right uh, views itself as being in a, a battle to the death with the federal government. Ruby Ridge, for them, was the opening shot of that war. Critics complain there was no real investigation and no real punishment after the 1992 incident. It's now clear their voices have been heard. Amid intense federal scrutiny of the Ruby Ridge scandal, the FBI's number two man was demoted, three other agents were suspended, and one was sent to jail. And the Weaver family won a $3.1 million settlement from the federal government. Law enforcement typically changes not because someone has a brilliant idea. We change because we're sued or there's public opinion that speaks against us. And we realized we had to change, we had to do this better. Since the early 1990s, the FBI says it's overhauled how it responds to armed standoffs and trained hundreds of police departments across the country. The federal deadly force policy can't be modified on the fly, as it was at Ruby Ridge. Basically, throw us a bone? Yeah. You gotta help me help you. Yeah. And agents now trained to set up better communication on the scene. Organizationally, we've changed, right? So the negotiators are fully embedded within our tactical section. All right, so shield, shield, cover. If you can slow things down and negotiate and peacefully communicate with the subjects and try to figure out what's motivating them, then you should take full advantage. Can you hear me in the bus? This is Katie with the FBI. I want to talk to you about how we're going to get the phone to you. You get involved in a shootout situation in America today, it's going to be litigated for years. We look at things differently now. We look and say, Time is not the issue it once was. Take the case of John Joe Gray in East Texas. Seven years after Ruby Ridge, Gray was stopped for a traffic violation and got into a fight with a state trooper and bit him. 
He then retreated to his farm with his weapons and refused to come out. John Joe Gray. How you doing? A 51-year-old self-proclaimed freedom fighter. What will happen if they try to raid this place? You come out after us, bring extra body bags. But local law enforcement made a unique decision. They decided not to raid his compound to bring him to court. You look at things like Waco, you look at things like Ruby Ridge, and I'm not sure that it is worth going out there and taking that chance. Henderson County Sheriff Ray Nutt is the fourth sheriff who's decided not to storm Gray's compound since the standoff began, and that's given this case a special status. Often it's called the longest running standoff in American history. He's been under self-imposed house arrest for 14 years. The longest term in prison I could have given him was 10. I probably wouldn't have given him 10. That doesn't satisfy Gray's former son-in-law, who watched his ex-wife take their two children into the compound and then disappear. Gray refused to talk on camera, but claimed he'll stay put indefinitely, living off the land and occasional help from a few supporters. If the police do come, he told us, I ain't going down without a fight. So far, the battle has remained oddly one-sided. This is more of, I don't know, a lounge off, because everybody's just kind of chilled into what it is. This isn't going to end until John Joe Gray passes on. It's not a perfect outcome to have somebody thumbing their nose at a lawful court order. But in the respect that nobody was killed, it's an acceptable outcome for me. In the two decades since Ruby Ridge, Sarah Weaver bought a small acreage in Montana with a portion of the settlement money, distanced herself from her father's beliefs, and made peace with the past. It's not easy being a Christian. Forgiveness is an ongoing choice and an ongoing process. I'm forgiving the people that showed up with tanks and guns and armored personnel carriers, and I'm forgiving the ones that pulled the trigger. I'm forgiving the ones that sent the orders. Forgiveness is not saying what happened is okay, because I believe if we forget those mistakes, they, they can be repeated.